glad to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. I'm going to ask that question again. And I'm feeling. The devil is a liar. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Yeah, I'm glad you're here. It's good to be back. Pastor Holly and I had an incredible time in Nairobi, Kenya, and Melindi, and um, just uh, got to see the church global. Come on, somebody. God's God everywhere. And while it's, they're sleeping right now, but man, just God's presence and power. I'm telling you, it's alive and well in the world. I witnessed it firsthand. Um, God is God everywhere. He's going to make sure he's God everywhere. Uh, there'll be no other gods before him. And uh, so, yeah, we had an incredible time. Thanks for praying for us. And, and we had an incredible time. Let's read the scripture. We're just going to read a little bit so I can let you sit. I know you didn't come to church to stand, uh, but you're welcome to. Matthew chapter 16. When, uh, verse 13, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I am? The, uh, who, do, who do they say the son of man is? We'll stop there. Lord, thank you for today, your power and your presence uh, for, for the amazing time of singing. What you did in the first service, oh, the many hands that went up to confess you as Christ, the son of the living God. Uh, I believe you're going to do even, even amazing things here in the second service. And we just give you praise and glory. And everyone said, amen. So be it. Give God a big fat praise as you're seated. Not a skinny one, but a, a big one. Before we do continue reading this morning, just some things that I, I wanted just to put on your radar again that you, you saw on the, uh, the screen. But just wanted to bring to your attention. Uh, if you were with us last year, we started a new tradition that we're carrying on this year called Walk to the Manger. And last year as a church... We gave $17,000 on Christmas Eve. Give yourselves a hand. Like, that's, that's impressive. That's awesome. So we didn't really know what to expect, but because you set the bar so high, uh, we're just believing for $20,000 this year. And, uh, amen, go big or go home, right? So uh, the three things that we're giving to this year, uh, and this is in no particular order, if you will, but uh, one of them is, our, is called Fire Bibles. Fire Bibles is something that we as a church have supported for, for years. And what Fire Bibles is, uh, there's many people that print Bibles and send them around in, native, in, in heart languages and native languages of countries. But what's unique about a Fire Bible, it is a Pentecostal study Bible uh, that is written in a heart language, in a, in a native language. And so, for example, one of the projects they just finished was the Farsi language, and it's spoken in places, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, different uh, sects there that, that uh, speak that language. And it is, it's, it's for the believer or the local pastor who won't be able to ever go to seminary or to Bible college, but is pastoring maybe an underground church or a local church of five, ten people, whatever it is, in a home, or whatever that looks like. They can have a Pentecostal study Bible with notes, a concordance, um, all the things that, that a, if you will, a Western pastor might have at his disposal or her disposal to preach the message. And so it's something that your pastors have been certainly uh, passionate about because we take it for granted. We have Bibles everywhere. Like I have Bibles in the back I can't give away. Like you know what I'm saying? Like everybody probably has ten Bibles in their home, eat like real legit like, you know, paper Bible. And then we've got the digital Bible. Right? Like I'm straight up in Malindi, Africa, in Kenya, opening up my digital Bible. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's everywhere. And, and Pastor Holly and I have been able to, we go to a conference every year where they, they update us on what Bibles they're working on. And we've been able to see firsthand, like, you know, home footage video of, of people receiving a paper Bible for the first time. And we were told in China, we didn't see the video, but we were told in China what they would do is they literally would tear all the pages out, and they would once they read a page, they would share it with each other so that everyone got a piece of the Bible. Come on, somebody. I mean, you know, just a desire for God. So we're going to support that project. We support Pleasant Hills Children's Home, which is in Fairfield, Texas. We've supported that ministry for years. Our teenagers went last summer and, and helped paint a two-mile fence and worked there, and, and it's a children's home that... Uh, that we've supported for years, and so we want to bless them around uh, around uh, Christmas time as well. 
And last of all, our building campaign, not just our future building, but our current project. Some of you that have kids, you might have noticed uh, the big hole in the wall that's finally opened. And so our early childhood and the ark, man, our special needs room, it, it's, it, we're so close. We've got lights on, audio's coming, all the equipment has arrived, uh, the toilets are here, the, the, everything's here. So they're going to be wrapping that up soon. We're going to have a grand opening. So just thank you for your giving to that, and, and you'll just come prepared to give um, for uh, during our, our, our Christmas Eve services. Two services, amen? Come on, like, we've been growing so much, got two Christmas Eve services. Bring somebody with you that they could hear about the love of God, amen? This morning, I want to uh, begin a series of Christmas messages, and today I'm, I'm leading off with, well, with, with what I believe is a Christmas message you've never heard before. So find two people say, get ready, get ready. Oh, come on, 930, outdid you, don't let them show you up. Come on, say, get ready, get ready. ready. I'm going to say it like Bishop T.D. Jakes, you know, get ready, get ready, get ready. You know what I'm saying? Like, get ready. Um, because in our culture today, I believe the church, the global church, the capital C church, um, if you're watching the same news that I'm watching and you are, it's all the same, what we are seeing in the world today is a spirit of antichrist, a spirit of anti-Christmas. And so I want to talk about that today. And now you're like, wait a second, what kind of Christmas message is this? He tricked us, man. They put up Christmas trees and snow, and it snowed on some, but not all of them, but it snowed. And <laughs> now, you know, we got wassail and hot coffee. Come on, Pastor, I want, a, I want a Christmas message. I'm about to give you one. I'm about to drop the mic real quick. Amen. Three things I want you to write down that you need to know about the spirit of Antichrist or Anti Christmas. Number one, that we have to have a public confession. There has to be a public confession that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Number two, you need to have a private confession. In your alone time daily with God, there's a private confession that you make every day. Lord, I confess you as Lord over my life, my marriage, my finances, my career, my agenda, my plans, my future, my dreams, my children, my grandchildren, my hope. I confess you private. And last of all, a personal confession. We're going to unpack all of these in a few moments. But a personal confession where you are my God. You're not just the God of my pastor or the God I read about in the Bible or learned about in Sunday school. But you are my, he's my God. You know, he's, he's personal to me. It's, it's it, we intimate. We walk together. We commune together. You know, he, he's with me. And, and it's a, a, a personal confession. On the way back, because it was a 20-hour flight, Got to watch a lot of movies. And one of the, I watched a sports documentary on Usain Bolt. I would, it's got to watch his incredible documentary and just about like him as a child. For those who don't know who Usain Bolt is, I, we've been living on a rock, I'm not for sure, but he's the fastest man in the world, by the way. He's from Jamaica. And, uh, you know, just he was fast as a kid and just got even faster. And so it was just about him training and how he was naturally gifted and his family and his dad and his mom and all this stuff. But, one of the things that I was so enamored with um, in terms of his coach and his training, uh, which uh, propelled him to win so many gold medals, was that he was almost obsessive in his training about how he started and how he finished. How he started the race and how he finished the race. How he got off the block and how he crossed the finish line. And he, he talks about... Because he was naturally talented and, and naturally fast, until he really started moving up in competitions, he didn't have to try that hard. He could just blow everybody out of the water. Like, and it's incredible when you watch him how far ahead he could be. And sometimes he would even like toy with these people. Like he'd slow down to let them catch up. And he, I'm serious, and he would speed up. You're watching, it's like he's just slowing down and speeding up, and he's just blowing everybody out of the water. But as he got older and he's moved up into the Olympics, real competition came. And so his coach was telling him, like, you may be gifted, you may be talented, but if you, if you don't know how to start well and finish well, you're never going to win. And there are some of us in here who maybe have had a bad start. Maybe you didn't get a fair start. Any real Christians in here? Give me some feedback. Come on. This is my second time to do this this morning, so. 
Like, you get a fair start in life. Maybe you, maybe you grew up on the other side of the tracks. Maybe you didn't have a, uh, maybe you just raised by a single parent or something. And you just, whatever it was, you get a fair start. Maybe you, maybe you grew up in poverty. You, didn't, you just didn't get a fair start. And that's, I'm sorry. But your bad start doesn't mean you have to have a bad finish. Come on, somebody. And I'm here to declare and speak over to you that your finish is going to be amazing and spectacular. And it's going to glorify and edify God. Look at somebody and say, finish well. Now, the reason I said all that is because you need to know that our Lord and Savior didn't have a fair start. If you've ever read in detail the story of Jesus, I mean, I bet everybody here, for the most part, I bet was born in a hospital. Now, there's some older generation, you're like, Pastor, you don't even know where I was born in a house. You know, like, that poor old mom, you know, buying on a piece of wood and go, you know, no pain, no gain. Like, now I got epidurals and pain blah. Anyway, let's just move on from that. I'm digging myself a hole there. I don't even know what I'm talking about anyway, so. I'm just a bystander watching, you know. I'm like, what do I do, you know. Just sit in the corner, shut up, and don't say anything, right. So, anyway, where is that? Yeah, so, so Jesus, I mean, he, had a, he, had, he didn't have a fair start. He was born in a manger. Like, wait a second. The king of the world was born among animals and straw? By the way, a manger is not what, what we depict it to be today. It wasn't this wooden structure out. It was most likely... Uh, probably a, a hole that was honed out in a, like a cave that would have been a manger. And animals would have been in there. And shameless plug, when you go with me to Israel next year, you'll get to see a manger. We'll get to see what a manger would have been and, and could have fit animals in there. And, and so anyway, he was born in this like cave area. And, 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 and not just that, but was, was born into a, a teenage family. Like Joseph and Mary, scholars believe, most likely were 19, 18 years old. I have an 18-year-old daughter, and she's not ready for a kid. She's not ready to be married yet either, in Jesus' name. Satan is a liar, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> if you're watching, baby, you know, thus saith the Lord. But so he was born in a cave, born to teenage parents. Listen, I'm 40-something years old. We'll leave it at that. Like, I'm still figuring out the whole parenting thing. I can't even imagine. And I'm not knocking anyone that had the teenage pregnancy. I'm just, and, and then, and then on top of that, Herod at the time, because he had heard about this king come and says, I've got to kill all the first male born boys in this country so this king cannot come and overthrow my government. So in the middle of the night, an angel appears to Joseph and says, hey, you need to get your family, get out of here, man. Herod's coming straight for you. So that Jesus has to flee his home with his family to Egypt, and eventually he makes his way. But even if his start wasn't fair, can we not all agree that his finish was awesome? Because what did Jesus say when he was on the cross? It is finished. And I'm speaking over you today. I don't know who this is for. Give me something, a nod, an amen, a hand wave. Won't he do it? Something. I mean, like... If you didn't have a good start, that doesn't mean that your finish doesn't have to be great. Finish well. And we see that with Jesus. So as we pick up our story in Matthew chapter 16, here is, here is Peter. Now, before we continue to read verse 14, what you need to remember is that, that Jesus, what he's doing right now, he's restoring Peter. Okay, so previously, there, there, now just for time's sake, there, there's a part where... Um, Peter's trying to get Jesus off of his mission, trying to, to, to derail him from his mission. Not necessarily, I think, intentionally or knowingly what he was doing, but because of his zealous type A personality, outspoken, uh, he, he, that's who Peter was. And God would go on to use him incredibly in the books of Acts. He was the, he was the first pastor of the local church. In, in Catholic circles, he's considered the first saint. I mean, Peter went on to do great things for God. But before that, his start was horrendous. He messed up everything. And there's this part where Peter and Jesus are having this dialogue. And Jesus says this to Peter. Get thee behind me, Satan. 
Now, we've joked with our friends before, right? Like someone offers you a donut, you're like, and you're on a diet, you're like, get behind me, Satan, you know, like not today, right? Whatever it is. But, but in front of the disciples in a crowd, Jesus rebukes Peter. And here in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus begins to restore Peter. He begins to restore him in front of the same crowd. So in verse 14, when he asked him, who do people say that I am? Some said John the Baptist. Oh, that's a good guy to be compared to. He did some pretty cool things. John the Baptist was a good guy. Some Elijah, man, Elijah did, man, stood up against 400 prophets of a false god. And, I mean, Elijah did, like, did some cool stuff. Uh, others say Jeremiah, he was pretty bad too, one of the prophets. And then Jesus asked this question. I, I, thank you for telling me what other people think about me. But what I really want to know is, what do my closest friends think about me? You know, like, I can, I can deal with a lot of interference on the outside, but in my inner circle, I got to know that you're with me. Come on, somebody. You know, you got to find a tribe and, and, and find your clique. You got to find, like, and, and Jesus is saying, I, I appreciate what they're saying on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. I, that's, that's, I can deal with all that, but, my, my, my. But, but the people who have been with me like no one else, man, I want to know, what, what do you say about me? Here's what I believe Jesus is really asking. I believe Jesus was really asking them, do you actually believe I am who I say I am? Yeah, I, I'm glad everyone else thinks I might have been a prophet, but, but I really want to know is because here's the thing. You guys have seen me raise the dead. You've seen me heal the leper. You've seen me restore a prostitute, restore a hand. I mean, you see me feed 5,000, not counting men. Then you saw me feed 4,000. I mean, you've seen me walk on water. You've seen me speak to wind and waves. I've done some great, and I just want to know, at the end of the day, do you actually really believe I am who I say I am, or is it just something that you've kind of, because I am who I am, you just, you get the coattails, you get the fanfare, we, we get to go to the front line of all the buffets, you know, we get everything we want because I'm Jesus, or do you actually, at the core of who you are, really believe I am who I say I am? I believe Jesus is asking the church today, because the spirit of antichrist, anti-Christmas, says that Jesus is not who he says he is. The spirit of Antichrist says that he isn't the son of God, that he is not the Messiah, that he was just a good prophet, that the Bible is just a good book. But I came to proclaim that it is the good news is what it is, and that God bankrupted eternity to send Jesus Christ to die for us, to be born in a manger, to go to a real cross, a real grave, and praise God, have a real resurrection. Is this thing on? Come on, somebody. So that we can live and have life. And in the church today, the capital C church, not in this church, but in, but in the capital C church, the spirit of Antichrist or Antichristmas, it parades and masquerades its sound, itself in words like tolerance, acceptance, and inclusiveness. It, it masquerades itself and it says if you're not tolerant, if you're not inclusive, if you're not acceptive, you're a bigot. You're a liar. You, you know, you don't love God. Well, let's talk about that then. You talk about acceptance. The Bible tells us that God wishes that none would die, but that all would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. You talk about acceptance. Gee, it says this, that while we were yet sinners, Roman tells us, that Christ died for us, that loved us. Aren't you glad that he didn't wait to, till we got all perfect before he decided to love us. That while we were jacked up, messed up, flawed, and a bunch of us still are, Jesus said, I'm going to go to a cross for you because I love you. Well, tolerance, I don't know if you know this or not, but just in case, the Lord doesn't tolerate any sin. He doesn't. Now, I don't know if that bothers some of you, and maybe it does, but he doesn't tolerate sin. And here's what else you need to know. And I want everyone to lean in emotionally. God doesn't tolerate you. He loves you. And some of you have lived a lie under a lie, a cloud that the enemy has placed over your whole life, that God is just 
putting up with you. He's just tolerating you. He's just kind of working around you. He's just, he's just, you're just kind of like, you know, you're just kind of there. and God's just been tolerating you. That is a lie straight from the pits of hell. God doesn't tolerate any of us. He is madly in love with all of us. He, I told you bankrupted eternity. What other uh, sign of love do we need to see that God so loves us? And inclusiveness, that God includes all of us into his plan. I mean, everybody gets to play a part. And every part is equal. If you agree with me, say amen. amen. So as we continue to read in verse 15, he said to them, but who do you say they am? Verse 16, Simon Peter Answer said, well, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. I'm going to stop there for a second. What you need to know is happening here is that this young Jewish man who is Peter and all the disciples, because Jesus was Jewish, what we need to understand that even today in, 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 in Israel and all around the world, wherever Jew, Jewish people are, there are Messianic Jews. Now, these are Jewish people that believe like we do that Jesus was and is the Messiah that was prophesied about in the Old Testament and is now it has come into the world. Other Jews believe that the Messiah is yet to come and that Jesus was just another prophet. He was, he was not and is not the Messiah. So at this time, these young men, these young disciples would have had the belief that Elijah and Daniel and, and, and uh, Isaiah and I'm drawing blanks on David when he prophesied in Psalm 21 over and over that, that a Messiah was to come. And now Jesus comes along claiming to be the son of the living God, the Messiah, and, and their rabbi. And all of a sudden, this young Jewish man, the lights go on, the dots connect for the first time, two and two equal four. And it wasn't when Peter walked on water. It wasn't when they saw him feed the 5,000. It was in this moment of God-given clarity that Peter looks at his rabbi for the first time and says, wait a second, You're the, you are the Christ. It's you. It was you the whole time. Now, Christ is not Jesus' last name. Some of you are going to be going home like, oh, I, can't, I got it. You're going to hit me up later on social media. No, listen. When, when Peter calls him the Christ, what you need to know is it is a title that Jewish people today that do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah are waiting to assign to or give that title to the Messiah that's to come. So when this young Jewish man looks at his rabbi and says, you're, you're him. That's, that's, that's him. He's the Christ, the son of the living God. And look what Jesus says to him. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, which is just the son of Jonah. Blessed are you. Because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. It is a fresh revelation, not given by the pastor or by a counselor or by a therapist or the latest speaker to make the circuits. It was done in a revelation, in a moment of God-given clarity that Peter realized for the first time in his adult life that Jesus Christ is exactly who he says he is, and he'll do exactly what he said he would do. Give God a praise. And so Jesus goes on in verse 18 to say this, and I also say to you, listen, he goes, that you are Peter. Now, Peter's like, yeah, I knew my name, but thank you for saying it out loud. Did everyone hear that? Jesus knows my name. I'm Peter. But here's what you need to know about the name of Peter. In Hebrew, it translates to Petros, which is where we get our word from Petra, rock. So when Jesus looks at him and says, Peter, Here's the word you need to know. Jesus is using a word that means small rock. Because I think we've read this scripture wrong and it's been taught wrong, so I'm about to teach it right. So look at your neighbor and say, pay attention, all right? Like, you don't want to miss this. Because we, we, I think a lot of us have read this when, when we read this, well, yeah, he's going he's gonna to build his church on me. That's not what Jesus said. He says, you are Peter, you're a small rock. You're a rock, all right, but you're the, you're the small rock. Look what he goes on to say. You're Peter. And on this rock, he changes the word there, and now it means large rock. 
He says, you're the small rock. We're the small rock. The large rock that he's building his church on is the confession of Jesus as the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Come on, somebody. I'm not going to build the church. You're not going to build the church. He will build his church. He will build it. God did not call me into the ministry to build a church. He called me to serve the church. And you are here to serve the church. We are the little rocks. The confession is the big rock that Jesus, and he says, that's how I'm going to build my church. When you confess publicly who I am, that's the rock that other people can run to. It's not you. It's not your talent. It's not your degrees. It's not your wit, your knowledge, or your wisdom. It is the confession that Jesus is the Messiah. Give God a praise if you believe it today. And he says, and even the gates of hell are Hades. Hallelujah. Satan's going to try his best, won't he? He's tried to derail us, hasn't he? He's tried his best to kill us, hasn't he? Anybody else in here living life? Or is it just me? Are you just like, no, I got it down, baby. I'm smooth as glass. Like, please, you ain't fooling nobody. We saw you limping in this morning. He's tried his best. But the Lord has made a promise to us. The gate, even the gates of hell. I mean, why would he say the gates of hell? Like the, the entrance to where and the exit to where everything comes and goes from hell. He said, everything that's coming in and out of that place will not prevail against my church. Amen. Now listen, he goes on to say, and he goes, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. That's awesome. Come on, have you ever, like, stopped to think about that? Like, well, all my keys are down there. He's like, here you go. Here you go. Here you go. When you confess me as the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, I'm giving you access to heaven. I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. And then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one, shh, just go, <laughs> shh, that he was Jesus the Christ. That's a weird thing for Jesus to do right there because the Great Commission, Matthew 28, says, now go out into all the world preaching the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Wait a second, Pastor Matt, I thought we were supposed to go out and preach the gospel. Now Jesus is telling us, shh. Jesus isn't saying that to us right now. What you need to know, what he was saying to his disciples is, I've got a cliffhanger coming. You ever watch something on Netflix and every episode you're like, well, now I have to finish the next episode. I can't go to bed not knowing what's happening. And then you watch what's happening and they do it to you again. You're like, oh, there's a long night coming. Is that real or is that just me? You know, you're like, I got to watch. I got to watch. There's no, no other option. God is, God's good at cliffhangers, isn't he? Like, we've lived them, haven't we? There's a bunch of cliffhangers like, well, what's going to happen next? And God's like, just wait and see. And here's what he was saying is, it's not that he doesn't want us telling everyone, because I'm telling you there's got to be a public confession. What he was saying in that moment in, in, in where he was in the culture was this. They need to see for themselves who I am and what I'm about to do. I'm going to close real quickly. Number one, a public confession is this. It's found in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. Therefore, the one who confesses and acknowledges me before men as Lord and Savior, affirming a state of oneness with me, that one I will also confess and acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. Don't miss this. But the one who denies and rejects me before men, that one I will also deny and reject before my Father who is in heaven. Jesus doesn't mince words. I mean, it, he just, he laid down the gauntlet right there. Now, here's what I forgot to tell you in the beginning that I need to tell you now. When we talk about Antichrist, if you're, if you're fa fairly 
have any wisdom or you've been to church enough, you've, you've, you've seen the, the last book in the Bible called the book of Revelation, right? It's, it, Revelation literally means what it says. It's a revelation of things to come. And in the book of Revelation, it talks about an antichrist, someone that will rise up in the last days at, in a tribulation period. And, and, and the Bible assigns to him the name antichrist because literally he will come claiming to be the Christ, And there'll be a bunch of people that will believe he is the Christ. A lot of scholars believe it will be Jewish people because they have not believed the the Messiah is yet to come. And now he is here. But he's the Antichrist. And and so in, 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 in the story of Revelation, the Antichrist is the antagonist of that story that is leading everyone away from the real God. But what you also need to know is that Antichrist literally just simply means this. Someone who refuses to acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah. See, what you don't know, you don't know. But now that you're here this morning, you have knowledge and revelation. And when we refuse to acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God, it's the spirit of Antichrist. So there has to be a public confession. This is why we do water baptism. It is an outward sign of an inward change. You are to go public with your faith. Like people, listen, God does not need any more clandestine Christians. If you don't know what that word is, it's a word that the CIA would use for like a secret agent. Some of you are like, Pastor Man, I'm just in a season of secretness. You know, God has called me to be quiet about my faith, not to be public. Bull, that's not found in the Bible. That's not scriptural. God wants us to be public with our faith. Some of us will talk more about food in a restaurant than we'll talk about Jesus on social media. I mean, people need to hear that he saves today, that he redeems today, that he heals today, that he delivers today, that he ransoms today, that he sets free today, that he sets free. People need to hear that. Number two, a private confession private, wait a minute, I need to have a public confession, yeah, a private confession is what I told you earlier, it's that daily quiet time with God, when I say God, you are Lord of my life, you're Lord over my marriage, over my home, my career, my finances not just publicly, but privately listen, you've heard me say this a lot I've said it many, many times, I'm going to say it again get it right privately it will manifest publicly right get it right privately you'll get it right publicly Meet with God privately one-on-one and, and you'll get it right publicly. Sinkholes are found in places where there once was a stream of water and it has disappeared or the stream has redirected. And believe it or not, the stream acts as support for the ground underneath because it's constantly feeding new sediment to where that area is. But once the stream dries up or is redirected, a sinkhole appears. And it swallows up everything that was where, where, where what's under it. And some of us, when we don't have, you need to know when we don't have a private communion time with God, it is like a sinkhole in our life. He is the living water. It flows from Him to us. When you don't have a personal private time with God, there will be a sinkhole in your life. And it will eat up everything there. Last of all, a personal confession. Romans 10, 9 says this. If we confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, the Bible says that we are saved. For with the heart a person believes in Christ, resulting in his justification, being made right with God. A public confession, a private confession, a personal confession, and a a, a private and a personal confession. We, we have to, in this day and age, must confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That there is no other way to God. I'm telling you, this is the best Christmas message I've ever preached. You want to know about Jesus coming to this world. God became flesh, come on, and dwelt among us. Put on shoes and clothes like us. Hebrews says that we do not have a high priest that cannot sympathize with us, but in every way has been tempted as we are tempted. God put on flesh for us, took on our sin for us, bore the penalty for us. That's what Christmas and Easter both are about. 
God doing what only God could do through the power of the Holy Spirit and the operation of His Son, Jesus Christ. Let's stand to our feet all across this place. God did some incredible things in the first service. I believe He's going to do some great things in the second service right now. Listen, we've got to have a public confession. I did it as an adult, and now you got to do it too. Maybe you're new to church. Maybe it's your first time ever in church. Maybe you're watching online, and a friend of a friend shared the live feed, and now you're tuning in, and the dots are connecting for the first time. But you're in the house today. You say, Pastor Matt, I needed to hear this. So maybe you're here for the very first time. You need to say that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Maybe it's been a long time since you've been in church. Perhaps you come every week, but you're just playing the game. You got one feet in and one foot in and one foot out, and you're not sold out. You're not really committed. It's just a box. It's just something you do every week. It's not a life that you really live. You're really backslidden on the inside. You're not living for God. But there is a heaven to gain, church, and there is a hell to shun. And it is my responsibility to my church this morning that I pastor to remind us in this Christmas season, the best antidote to the spirit of Antichrist is a public confession that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. So on the count of three, number one, every every eye open and no head bow. Number two, you know why you're here. Number three, raise your hand and say, Pastor Matt, that's me. And we're going to cheer. We're going to clap for you. Come on. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else? Amen. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Hold on, hold on, hold on. If you're watching online, tag her. Anybody raising their hand online, let me know. All right. Look at your neighbor and say, did you want to raise your hand and you didn't? Because I'm going to raise it with you. Come on, do me a favor. Look at everybody. Thank you, sir. All right. One, two, three. Come on, you want to raise your hand? Amen, amen, amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. Awesome. Yeah. You watch it online. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right, here's what we're going to do. Everybody together. Just gonna pray what I'm gonna pray, okay? You ready? Jesus, I confess that you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, that you died for me and you rose again for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Give God a great big praise.